The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. If there's one group of people who should understand the spirit world, it's Christians. We need to understand it. We need to learn more about it from the scriptures of God's holy word. Unfortunately, there are Christians who, as soon as you mention the spirit world or the spirit realm, they automatically turn off and stop listening to you. This is often because they have been put off by teachings about the spirit world from fanatic church groups and fringe denominations that engage in weird and strange practices. Nevertheless, I want to encourage everyone not to turn a blind eye to sound biblical teaching about the spirit world. The Bible teaches about a very real spirit world. To deny the reality of the spirit world is to deny the very Bible. To deny the reality of the spirit world is to reject the instructions of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is evil present in the world. Take a look at the world around you, and it is evident that there is a real evil force influencing this world we live in. Why else would people in this generation call good evil and evil good? Why else would they celebrate behaviors that God hates? Why else does it seem like people have lost their general common sense? Evil is present. Satan, the fallen one, is described as the God of this world, and he is influencing the minds of the people of this world. Do not be a naive Christian. Look at how the world is unfolding, and you can clearly see a malevolent spirit in this world. If there's one group of people who should understand the spirit world, it's Christians. You are not living and walking and breathing in the midst of humanity alone. You are living, breathing, and walking in the midst of spirits. And that should be something that you should always remember in your Christian walk. There are two basic types of demonic spirits that repeatedly show up in the New Testament. One is unclean spirits, and the other is demons. Now, let's look at these terms individually. One, unclean spirit. In the New Testament, the term unclean spirit is derived from the Greek words akathartos. It means unclean in a ceremonial, moral, or spiritual sense. This word is often used to describe things that are impure or not fitting for God's presence. Pneuma, this word can mean spirit, wind, or breath. In the context of unclean spirit, it refers to a spiritual entity or being. When the two words are combined in the New Testament, as in akathartos pneuma, they are typically translated into English as unclean spirit. This term often refers to demonic spirits or entities that are contrary to God and His purity. The term unclean spirit appears over 16 times in the New Testament Bible. 2. Demons or devils. In the New Testament, the term translated as devils in some English versions actually stems from two primary Greek words, diabolos, this word is typically translated as devil in many English Bibles. It is where we get the term diabolical in English. Diabolos means slanderer or accuser in the New Testament. It often refers specifically to Satan, the adversary. Daimonio. This word is often translated as demons in many modern English versions of the Bible. Daimonium refers to lesser evil spirits or supernatural beings subordinate to Satan. When the New Testament refers to individuals who are demon-possessed or have an unclean spirit, it is this term that's typically used. While diabolos is usually singular in reference to Satan, daimonium is the term most commonly used in the context of demonic possessions in the New Testament. Daimonium appears over 60 times in the New Testament. So, within the New Testament, there is a distinction between the usage of unclean spirit on one hand and demon on the other. These beings are real. In both the Old and New Testaments, we see how these entities have a tangible effect on this world. I have conducted extensive research and study in demonology, and I cannot find a single verse in the Bible indicating that these beings have ceased their operations in this world. Not one verse suggests this. On the contrary, my Bible indicates that in the last days, there will be an increase in demonic and evil spirit activity. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the earth, giving heed to seducing spirits, 
and doctrines of devils. Yet, if you were to attend the modern church, you might believe that demons no longer exist. The Bible never said this. The Bible never avoids this topic. Yet modern churches and modern preachers avoid this topic. Indeed, they will preach to you about getting a breakthrough, about getting rich, and about your dreams coming true. However, they will avoid the topic of demons. When there are people living in this world who face unclean spirits and devils every single day of their lives. I spoke to one lady who was under demonic attack. She attended her local church and spoke to the pastor, explaining how she was tormented by an evil spirit. She described how she would literally see objects moving in her home without any human intervention. She mentioned how doors would slam open in her house when no one was around. On some occasions, she felt physically pushed by an unseen force when alone in her house. At times, while sleeping, she would be pulled out of her bed. She consistently felt an ominous presence and the sensation of being watched. Instead of assisting this woman, the pastor turned her away. Can you imagine? A woman oppressed by demonic forces went to a church seeking help and was turned away. That very day, she purchased a Bible and began reading it aloud. The ominous presence she felt started to wane. Over time, the demonic manifestations she experienced became less frequent. Her deliverance from this evil spirit was not immediate. It was a process. And do you know what brought her relief? Just reading the Bible and coming to know Jesus, all the paranormal and demonic events in her life eventually ceased. This underscores an essential point about evil spirits. They do not fear you, your knowledge, or your resources. Remember, these are spirits that have been around far longer than any of us. They don't fear us. They fear Jesus. They fear God Almighty. James 2, 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. We live in an age where the world is saturated with unclean spirits. Allow me to divert for a moment to discuss demonic possession. Demonic possession did not end with the Bible. It continues today. Much of the lawlessness, wickedness, and evil we witness in our world can be attributed to demonic possession. We live in an age saturated with devils and spirit beings. Our world is full of unclean evil spirits. There are multitudes of them, an untold number. They invade people's lives. They are everywhere on earth, an untold number of them. They are in people's lives. They are all across the face of the earth. They've already come. But people don't see it. People are tormented by them in their homes, too. Afraid to share their experiences, these individuals see shadowy figures, hear unexplained footsteps, endure nightmares, and are even fearful of sleeping in the homes they own. I could recount more tales of people's encounters with evil spirits, but that's not the focal point of my sermon. The core message is clear. Turn to Jesus. If you are experiencing demonic attack, turn to Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is victory in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. There is hope and wholeness in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is peace in the name of Jesus. There is redemption in the name of Jesus. There is refuge in the name of Jesus. There is light in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is strength in the name of Jesus. There is grace in the name of Jesus. There is eternal life in the name of Jesus. There is sanctification in the name of Jesus. There is mercy in the name of Jesus. There is love in the name of Jesus. There is protection in the name of Jesus. There is restoration in the name of Jesus. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved, except the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. For Christians, we do not have to live in fear. Colossians 2, 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Consider the image painted in Colossians 2.15. It doesn't talk about a passive Christ who merely overcomes these powers. It describes a triumphant Christ who has disarmed the powers and authorities, making an open and public spectacle of them. Imagine a victorious warrior parading defeated enemies for all to see, signaling a clear, unambiguous triumph. This is the image of Christ's victory over these spirits, a victory so absolute 
that it's akin to a public decoration for all to witness. But there's more. Not only are these entities defeated, but they also fear Jesus Christ. The omnipotent, divine power of Christ is so immense that even these spirits tremble at His name. This profound reverence they have for Christ offers believers an added layer of assurance. It means that whenever a Christian says the name of Jesus, it's not just a call for help. It's a battle cry that resonates with victory and authority. As James 4, 7 advises, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This isn't merely a suggestion. It's a divine strategy rooted in the very nature of Christ's triumph. Although we live in an age saturated with devils and evil spirit beings, although we live in a world that is full of unclean evil spirits, there are multitudes of them, an untold number we do not need to fear. Why? One verse, one single verse, 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In essence, the divine spirit of Christ dwelling in every believer is infinitely more powerful than any eternal force, demonic or otherwise. Christians, therefore, are not mere bystanders in this spiritual war. They are empowered soldiers, armored with the might of Christ. In conclusion, while the presence of demons and unclean spirits is a reality, Christians have a greater reality to live in, Jesus Christ's unparalleled power and victory. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken, and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken, and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. So let every believer stand tall, unshaken, and resolute, knowing that in Christ they have nothing to fear. Also in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.